regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I have a dream that one day a soldier of peace this nation will rise up a soldier of peace live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream so a soldier of peace. I have Nonviolence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook. My co host is Michael Negler, and we're from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma. On Nonviolence Radio, we explore the power of active nonviolence around the world. Greetings, everyone. I'm Michael Nagler, and welcome to Nonviolence Radio for the end of January. We're going to start with a very exciting interview about a very exciting event that we all just experienced in this country, interview with Professor Stephen Zunas, and then I will follow that up with some of the news and resources. So greetings, everyone. Uh, we're very pleased uh, this evening to be able to interview uh, professor Stephen Zunas, who is a professor of politics and international studies at the University of San Francisco. Uh, he's also an associate editor of Peace Review, contributing editor of Tikkun, an academic advisor for the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, and a senior policy analyst for Foreign Policy and Focus. So, Stephen, first of all, welcome back to the show. Great to be with you again. So, Stephen, what we're going to talk about is uh, the remarkable unsung events around the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. Everybody is saying that uh, democracy in America has withstood the test. And I think that that's true, but I also think that there's much more to it and that you bring this out beautifully in your recent article in Yes! Magazine. So let me start us off with this question. Was it a coup that was attempted on January 6th? In effect, yes, uh, but it really didn't have much of a chance of succeeding. Indeed, uh, politically, it backfired terribly for the far right uh, and uh, for, for Trump and his supporters. The, the real threat of a coup uh, was earlier when you had a majority of Republican members of the House of Representatives, as, as well as close to a dozen uh, Republican senators, you know, trying to overturn the Electoral College, which, like the popular vote, had gone quite decisively uh, for uh, Biden. And the months after, between the election, and uh, January 6th, in, in those uh, two months, the efforts uh, by the uh, uh, Trump, uh, by Trump and, and his supporters to uh, basically overturn the results by challenge them in court and in the state legislature. That, that, was, the, that was the more serious threat. Uh, yeah. and, uh, but but uh, that was defeated as well. Yeah, but I, I think if Hannah Arendt <laughs> were to comment on this, she would say the very fact that that physical violence was attempted was a sign of the utter failure of the effort. Very much so. It was, I mean, like a lot of, uh, of things in the Trump administration, uh, there was a lot of um, hubris involved and uh, a lot of ineptitude. I mean, it was, I mean, it was, it was horrible what happened, of course, and, and not just in terms of the people who died, but also, I think for a lot of people, the the, the symbol of, of American democracy of being um, assaulted in, in such a way that it was really a matter of uh, of reckoning, and it also, I think, uh, underscored the very real threat of uh, right wing terrorism, something that uh, is still uh, very scary and and very real, and uh, something we'll have to deal with for uh, you know, some time to come. But uh, they they really didn't have uh, much of a chance of, of succeeding, and uh, that that I think it, you know gives credit to the uh, 
not not just the the institutions of of government, which I think a lot of people are emphasizing, uh, but the uh, the willingness of a large number of Americans uh, to uh, have engaged in massive nonviolent resistance if there was indeed a more serious kind of coup attempt. Yeah, and that is exactly where I wanted us to go, uh, Stephen. I was reminded of uh, the summary that Mahatma Gandhi gives in the preface to uh, Satyagraha in South Africa, where he talks about the five stages of Satyagraha that had already unfolded in India at that time. And for one of them, Satyagraha didn't even have to actually be carried out. He said the mere threat of Satyagraha was enough to make the government back off and reverse its course. And I, and I see kind of an echo of that here, that the offer to carry out Satyagraha, like a pledge of resistance kind of campaign, probably took a lot of wind out of the sails of the people who were trying to overthrow the election from within and, and around and without the government. Would you agree with that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, some time in advance, it was clear that there was going to be some kind of effort by Trump to s steal the election. There was concern he might declare victory on election night before all the votes were counted, that he and supporters would make false charges of vote fraud, that he and he'd refuse to concede even if it was, after it was clear that Biden uh, was, was the um, winner. And uh, it was also fear that uh, he would wage a legal battle to challenge the legitimate results, try to convince Republican election officials not to certify the results, encourage state legislators to uh, appoint Republican electors regardless of the vote count in the state, and, and convince the Republican-dominated federal judiciary to uphold these legal measures. And this is exactly what happened. However, in knowing this was going to happen, you had um, many thousands of people who uh, organized to, to challenge it. And a part of this is what we learned from other countries. I mean, in the Philippines in 1985, and Serbia in 2000, Ukraine in 2004, and Gambia in 2016, when you had these incumbent regimes attempting to steal the elections, there were, there were large nonviolent action campaigns that succeeded in forcing the election results to be honored. And people also looked at uh, more conventional coup attempts uh, you know, in places like Bolivia, Argentina, Soviet Union, Burkina Faso, you know, which were similarly reversed as a result of popular uh, civil resistance. And, and we started looking at that. What, 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 what were the common factors? We looked at the rapid popular mobilization, the massive non-cooperation, the broad alliances of democratic forces, the maintaining of nonviolent discipline. And, and so you had a whole series of groups like... A, Choose democracy and uh, hold the line and uh, protect the results and and others that started organizing, doing nonviolence training. Uh, the, even the more mainstream uh, groups, uh, uh, various uh, liberal public interest groups and environmental groups and others got involved. The AFL-CIO, President Richard Trumka raised the possibility of a general strike and a number of city and state uh, uh, AFL-CIO chapters uh, explicitly um, uh, promised that they would uh, they would do that, and, and as a result, I think it, it got a lot of lot of people, you know, a lot of Republicans and pro Republican elements like the business community to kind of start thinking about that. I mean, the business community, of course, really appreciated Trump's uh, tax breaks and deregulation and all the goodies that he provided them, but you know, the prospect of uh, the country shutting down <laughs> and uh, to have many months of, of disruption, of blockades, of occupations, of, of non-cooperation and, and general strikes. I mean, one thing that capitalists really care about is stability. <laughs> and they did not want to see this kind of thing uh, uh, come about. So I think they realized they would you know, rather have a, a you know, moderate Democrat uh, in charge who might be a little, little tougher on them than, than Republican than to resist then have to deal with this massive uh, disruption that would come from uh, that would inevitably result if Trump yeah. indeed uh, you know, tried to get away with stealing the election. Yeah. yeah, so that was a good example of a nonviolent threat. But you mentioned a couple of other things that I wanted to uh, emphasize here. One thing, the collaboration with mainstream groups. Now, we know from Erica Chenoweth 
that this is one of two critical factors that enable a nonviolent movement of some scale to succeed. One is a large amount of outreach, and especially the collaboration with mainstream groups, which gives it legitimacy, enormous legitimacy, and then also maintaining nonviolent discipline. And that's partly a factor just because ordinary folks don't want to run out and go in the street if people are going to be throwing bricks and rocks around and even getting tear gas. So, but more importantly than that, I think it gives a consistency and a, again, a legitimacy to any movement if people show that they can exercise enough restraint to be nonviolent. So those are two really critical factors. And, you know, now that I think of it, Stephen, there's a third, that people were able to start before the thing erupted. Yeah, that, that, that was critical, that there, there was training and preparation beforehand. And, uh, and it was pretty exciting, actually. You, you, you had um, thousands and thousands of people who, were, who did online nonviolence training. Uh, most of whom who'd never done that before, and it's uh it, and it, and it's pretty exciting because even though it wasn't necessary to uh, reverse the um, or never that wasn't necessary to uh, reverse a serious coup attempt, uh, indeed the the organizers of these things uh, tried to reassure people that the uh, Trump administration's uh, efforts were pretty amateurish and probably not get very far, so no need to panic. But the the fact that beforehand. People were prepared for this possibility. You know, it was played a major role in the deterrent effect. But the cool thing about it is that you have these thousands of people who are now trained in nonviolent action, who will be ready to utilize it if we need to on any number of factors, whether it be uh, racial justice or uh, an overseas war or climate change or, or whatever. And um, also, the, the, what was fascinating was that you know, in, in, in light of this uh, preparation, uh, you had all this mainstream media coverage. I mean, New Yorker, The Atlantic, Guardian, Newsweek, CNN, Boston Globe, Washington Post, they all had these articles about nonviolent revolution in the United States. I mean, you know, it, it, it was amazing that people were actually you know, seriously talking about this and thinking about this. And, and so I, I think, you know, again, having that, that preparation was important. The, the thing that you, you mentioned about broad alliances that, you know, and, and when you look at places like the uh, Philippines, Serbia, Ukraine, and, and Gambia, and each where, where you had the uh, incumbent regimes stealing the election, and each of those, the the candidates uh, of the, the opposition candidates who had the election stolen from them initially, were like Biden. They were pretty mainstream. They did not have a lot of excitement. Uh, did not get a lot of excitement within the activist community. But the activist community there, as here recognize it wasn't about supporting a particular um, centrist candidate. It was about protecting democracy. And so people were willing to, um, you know, to that a lot of people on the left, a lot of people were pretty far left, you know, reckon that were quite willing to, to work with uh, more traditional you know, liberal groups in, um, in, in preparing uh, for just this, uh, this kind of scenario. And that's just a critical uh, element in success of groups. It, it's kind of like what the Quakers are famous for, that they will cooperate with anybody who observes certain nonviolent guidelines for a particular effort without demanding that they are ideologically aligned. And that gives them a great deal more outreach and a great deal more power and actually forms a kind of blueprint for the future, how we have to go forward. The, the thing that it makes me the most enthusiastic about all of this, uh, which really leapt out at me from your article and from what you're saying now, is that not only was this thing prepared for in advance, it constitutes preparation in advance for things coming up. Because nonviolence often has to reinvent the wheel when there's a, a, a threat, a challenge. And at a severe disadvantage. But here we're talking about tens of thousands of trained people who have empowered themselves, feel very good about what they did, and will be ready, as you were saying, in case things like this happen going forward. 
Yes, and it comes out of after four years of uh, record-breaking activism. I mean, if you look at the, the Trump era, particularly uh, this past year, uh, with Black Lives Matter uh, emerging as this unprecedented uh, movement, that uh, more Americans have been involved in more demonstrations, uh, again, both in terms of the demonstrations and the numbers participating, than in any four-year period in American history including the 1930s, including the 1960s. And so you, you already have this big activist base and you have the, the preparation for a possible coup de Does it really stress the idea that we need to think strategically. We need to plan ahead. This can't just be uh, spontaneous. I mean, even without that, 93% of the Black Lives Matter protests were completely nonviolent, despite those who want to try to depict it uh, uh, otherwise. And the vast majority of the remaining seven percent were primarily nonviolent, uh, but did have did have some you know vandalism, rioting, and and other uh, other elements uh, involved. But the the fact that you this combination of people who are, are have shown a willingness to hit the streets and a willingness to you know be willing to to face arrests and to engage in, in massive uh, non cooperation. Because one thing that really was important about these trainings was it emphasized the importance of non cooperation. That, uh, that it underscores, you know, what Gene Sharp and a lot of other people, and, and, and Gandhi and, and so many other people have, have, have talked about before, is that uh, that governments are only as, as strong as people's willingness to cooperate. And if we do not give allegiance to illegitimate authority, they no longer have authority. If we do it in sufficient numbers and 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 we do it in a in a strategic manner. And I think that was what was really uh, important in, in emphasizing these trainings, not just oh, it's a, not, not not just the importance of being nonviolent, but being nonviolent in a strategic manner. Yeah. So the two big factors, strategy and training, that really worked into this successful event, uh, and I think people have not yet recognized how important this uh, nonviolent resistance was simply because it wasn't, you know, it didn't have to be mobilized. But again, going forward, it seems to me, the fact that these trained groups are ready to be mobilized will make people think twice before they carry out some of the attacks on our democracy that we got, unfortunately, used to seeing over the last four years. It strikes me that, in a way, We've been vaccinated. <laughs> we we had a little event that really, as you say, didn't have a whole lot of threat to it. And yet it was enough for us to mobilize the body politic with these antibodies that mm -hmm. are ready to go now. Exactly. And, and, and you know, again, as the, um, the white um, you know, patriarchal order... Uh, that has dominated American uh, political life uh, since its founding, is being you know challenged, you know by the emergence of um, of uh, women, minorities, uh, other historically disenfranchised groups. You have those who are lashing out. That's why you see the rise of this kind of uh, right wing extremism and the conspiracy theories and all the crazy stuff that. Um, it's always been there to some degree, but Trump has really, um, you know, brought to the fore as they see their their power uh, slipping away. And you know, there. So you know, there again, there there is a right wing terrorism is indeed a a, a real threat. But I, I try to reassure people that these guys are not going to win. You know that we do have a, you know, this only a minority support this kind of thing. And the majority is willing to resist it to um, save democracy. And even when it comes to the threat of right-wing terror, let's remember that um, that uh, I, I grew up in the South in the 50s and 60s, and there was right-wing terror there, quite a bit of it. You know, hundreds of people died. We, 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 know, we know mostly about a few of the famous cases, but there were hundreds who died from the Knight Riders, from the Ku Klux Klan. And and yet people recognize that even even there that that that, that nonviolence was still the best way to resist it, and uh, that uh, there was a, um, a, a a blowback, or some people call it um, you know, political jujitsu, some call it the um, you know paradox of repression. There are other other names uh, that are used, but that the violence 
of the uh, right-wing extremists uh, got more sympathy and more support you know, for the uh, civil rights struggle. And similarly, the prospects of right-wing terrorism are terrifying. Indeed, there'll be some tragic losses, I think, in the coming years as a result. But I, I think that will only, uh, if the opposition, if the Democratic left can maintain uh, our uh, nonviolent resistance in the face of it, uh, it will only strengthen us in the long run. Very, very good to look forward to. And it does remind me of an episode at the end of the Montgomery bus boycott where uh, somebody threw a bomb but nobody paid any attention. And in a way, it just defanged this threat of violence coming from the right. So we ha I hope we have a lot of that to look forward to, as well as the tragic losses that will be suffered. But you know, uh, Stephen, you bring up uh, this critical factor of the right-wing extremists feeling that their power is being taken away from them. And feeling that they are, just to quote their own language, you will not replace us. They fear that they're going to be replaced rather than joined by the minorities and the women and so forth. So it strikes me that while we're doing all this training and strategizing and getting ready to re resist events and attempts like this, we also could be working on somehow reaching those people and reassuring them that it's, it's okay not to have dominating violent power at your disposal. It's okay to join in with other people and have a common, dare I say it, uh, a lo you know, loving community rather than dominated by one particular group. I'm not sure how you would go about that, but I think it would be a valuable compliment very, very, very much so. And then, you know, and I, I think uh, it involves a whole lot of things, everything from um, uh, from uh, listening skills and, you know, the uh, you know, the ability to really see what's all underneath that and then fight to change the things that, um, uh, you know, that contribute to the alienation. I mean, the fact is, is that the uh, neoliberal economic order, you know, has uh, ended up hurting, you know, people across the uh, political spectrum, especially the, the poor and working class, and the uh, overseas wars that our country keeps finding itself in has uh, disproportionately taken the sons and daughters of, um, of poor and working class people, again, uh, uh, across the um, ethnic and, and racial divide. And indeed, part of, of Trump's uh, uh, appeal is that, you know, there, there are plenty of conservative Republicans out there. But what Trump was able to do was that he was able to, you know, disingenuously, of course, um, you know, come across as someone who was anti-war. I mean, in part, uh, Clinton's loss was that he was able to portray her as a hawk that would support the Iraq war and other interventions, and he was going to bring troops home, and, and someone who had all these ties to Wall Street and and that kind of thing. I mean, cr criticisms that you always also hear from supporters of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> but what Trump did was basically he took some of that understandable upset and put it in in his very uh, you know reactionary and, and, and bigoted you know kind of a, a, a framework. And not to mention, of course, that he was you know as pro war and and um, pro Wall Street <laughs> as anybody. And so I think it's uh, you know critically important that we continue challenging. You know Biden and the more mainstream Democrats, uh, you know, uh, from the left, because I think until um, the uh, the Biden administration and, and congressional Democrats are willing to, you know, challenge the uh, neoliberal paradigm and challenge the military-industrial complex and be willing to uh, let's look at the uh, you know, the, the real serious changes we need in society, it leaves an opening for um, uh, right-wing demagogues. Uh, to uh, take advantage of the uh, widespread uh, discontent that does indeed hurt much of the white working class population that, that were part of Trump's base. May I request that you write an article on that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that is critically important. Uh, you know, something along these lines, uh, a little deeper into the psychology of the former president, which is, you know, difficult to look into, reminded me that his definition of power, where he said he could murder somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. That shows how powerful he is. So 
we could get a lot of traction by showing people that there is another kind of power that's accessible to them, you know, nonviolent kind. Very much so. I mean, that's, I think the appeal of demagogues like Trump, and we've seen this in other nations and in other uh, kinds of uh, times of uh, uh, times of history, is that they are, you know, they recognize the sense of powerlessness that people um, feel, and they are able to, to manipulate that. They're able to kind of represent the kind of, of, of power that you know, people see that they are are missing out on in terms of the what they've seen from the traditional elites. However, if we encourage people to uh, be, become involved in a power that comes from the bottom up, a power that comes from the uh, from nonviolence, a power that comes from building community, uh, building alliances uh, across uh, racial and, and ethnic and, and gender and, and other lines. That you know, people can, that can have a real stake in the system. You know, that, that is a stake in challenging the system, you know, from the from the bottom up, instead of trying to hope somebody can come from the top down and change things for them. I mean, this this is when I think we can we can uh, you know really uh, start making a difference. Yes, I completely agree. We'd be coming at this from two uh, directions. You know, kind of a pincer movement. Uh, I wanted to get back. We're coming close to the end of our conversation here, unfortunately. But I want to get back to Atpour for a second. You mentioned this parallel of uh, if Serbia in the year 2000. And it also just leapt out at me because that's an iconic movement that everyone in the nonviolence field knows about. And it, it, I started thinking, wow, this is such a parallel. But then I realized, you know, in a way, it was the exact opposite. It, it was the people who protected the democracy who were uh, breaching the walls of the capital in Serbia, in Belgrade. And uh, they were not violent except for a little bit of arson that did break out. But they were nonviolent and nobody got killed. And they didn't experience blowback, backfire, because they accomplished what they wanted to do. And that just, you know, it shows to me once again that when you do something nonviolently, you're going to have good effects that radiate out into the future that you haven't even planned, even if you don't succeed in your immediate effort, which in fact happened here on January 6th, because the big mobilization wasn't possible or necessary, and yet all of these good things roll out of it that you've just been putting your finger on so accurately. Stephen, do you have one more comment you'd like to close us off with? Well, it's just that I, I think that we are we should celebrate the fact that we still you know have a democratic republic. And to uh, to recognize that the um, we, the reason we still have that is not just our, our constitution and the legal guarantees uh, that that we have, uh, but the, the power of ordinary people because it's the power of ordinary people that um, improved on the limits of American uh, 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 democracy um, and the and the constitution over the years and. It is this, these not these nonviolent movements that have protected it over the years from various um, authoritarian threats, and it's what's going to uh, protect us and, and bring us forward in the future. Superb! That's a beautiful wrap up. Uh, yeah, I would I completely agree. Celebrate, but without triumphalism, <laughs> which will only make things worse. Uh, and uh, I, I really hope that this message gets out loud and clear. Well, we're at the very end. Uh, Stephen Zunis, thank you very, very much for a very informative interview, and I hope to have you back yet again at some point going forward. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephanie Van Hook, and you've just been listening to Michael Negler and Stephen Zunis talk about nonviolent resistance in the United States. Let's turn now to Michael's nonviolence report. Greetings, everyone. Uh, This is Michael Nagler, and uh, I'm bringing you the news that goes along with the interview that you just heard. 
by between myself and my and Stephen Zunas, you know, it, it, we're we're saying that it's likely that the a huge factor in the failure of the coup was the way that these millions of Americans were prepared to rise up in protest. Now, that's not unlikely because we know there is a phenomenon called the Pledge of Resistance. It started during the wars, uh, the low intensity conflict against Nicaragua, where our friend and colleague Ken Buttigan prepared a campaign and enlisted about 5,000 people who sent postcards to the White House saying, if you invade Nicaragua, this was the Reagan White House, if you invade Nicaragua, you're going to have to face massive civil disobedience. And he never did, never did that invasion. So we know that such a thing is possible. Uh, sometimes the mere threat of satyagraha is enough to forestall injustice. In the preface to Satyagraha in South Africa, Gandhi talks about a significant incident uh, in his own development of Satyagraha in India, where at one point merely preparing Satyagraha made the government back down from a particular injustice. So we don't have hard and fast data here yet. We hope we will. I remember that President Nixon kept claiming that the uh, pro massive protests against the Vietnam War had no effect on him, but we know from insider reports that he was looking through the blinds in the White House and, and was uh, very much watching the level of public resistance. So there was at least one episode of bystander intervention by a monitor in the DC peace teams who got in between a, uh, an activist who was going to try to breach the Capitol and a black protester against that action, the activist pulled out a knife. But the monitor from DC peace teams was well-trained and managed to talk him down and put his knife away and walk away. So we know there was at least that one episode. Of course, the peace team presence at this event was minuscule. That's part of the problem. That's what we want to do is really take nonviolent intervention to scale. But the fact is that training and organizing began over the summer. And it reminds me way back in 1992, when there was a Russian coup, and it was prevented by people. And the media said, well, we have no idea where this big protest happened. It just spontaneously arose. Well, it didn't. Uh, I know of one person at least our friend David Hartso, who was in Moscow that whole summer conducting nonviolent trainings. But this time, as you heard from Professor Zernes, the media response is very different. And this is a game changer that the mass media, the mainstream media uh, definitely recognized that there is a popular movement of a massive scale going on here. And they constantly used the word nonviolence. So groups like Choose Democracy and Hold the Line, that 55-page resource, and Protect the Results, which was able to coordinate over 200 organizations, including mainstream organizations, and they were ready to mobilize millions of Americans if things unfolded in the way that they feared, namely that there was an actual coup. So going forward, the encouraging thing is you now have tens of thousands of Americans who are trained in nonviolent direct action. So my key takeaways from this event are how violence always backfires. It always causes what the CIA calls blowback. And it was very dramatic this time. Uh, and that on the other hand, nonviolence always works. It doesn't always, quote, work, do what you want it to do. In this case, it didn't even have to try, but it always does good work going forward. And usually it's more than what you planned for or you expected because you're unleashing a positive constructive force into the world and that force will do its work. There's one other little issue here uh, about what we were calling earlier the threat of Satyagraha. Now, in talking about 
Kenneth Boulding's Three Faces of Power, we were always careful to distinguish between threat power, which is the most violent kind, where you say, you better do something I want or I'll do something that you don't want. So we want to distinguish between that and uh, integrative power, which is nonviolence, where you say, I'm going to do something that represents the truth and it will bring us more closer together. I'm going to be authentic and it'll bring us closer together. But there, there's no question that there are times in Satyagraha where you do telegraph what is going to be the result if the opponent does X, Y, and Z. And uh, maybe, maybe it's just, I'm um, just caviling here, but I do think that's not the same thing as a threat. Because you're really saying, if you do something that neither of us really wants, we're going to do something to prevent you from doing that. So I don't know. It's a, it's a gray area, perhaps. But I think there's room for uh, telegraphing what you're going to do. And it doesn't really count as a threat in the sense of the threat power in, in building three faces. So related to this episode and it's marvelous uh, going forward, there is a bill before Congress right now, H.R. 1, and it's titled For the People Act of 2021. Here's the mission statement, as you, if you will. To expand Americans' access to the ballot box, reduce the influence of big money in politics, strengthen ethics rules for public servants, and implement other anti-corruption measures for the purpose of fortifying our democracy and for other purposes. Now, this bill would accomplish all three of the de democratic reforms that I have been calling for and say we need to ha have accomplished. One being the uh, vacating of Citizens United to get that money out of politics. And deeper than that is the premise of Citizens United that abstract entities can be human beings. And in the tremendous change that has to take place between what uh, Martin Luther King called our thing-oriented civilization and a person-oriented civilization, that would have the, that deep effect as well as getting corporate money out of politics. Uh, the bill would also circumvent or disband, I'm not sure which, the Electoral College and 24 states already have decided to work around it by just giving all their elector votes to the winner of that state. Uh, and my third thing was a Voting Rights Act, which this is. And I also think we need somehow to soften the two-party system because in our present combative culture, wherever you have two parties or two teams or two people, <laughs> it's bound to be a polarization. And that's what the point of third party nonviolent intervention is. It softens that polar relationship between uh, two parties in opposition. Now, of course, uh, there is even a possibility that the outgoing president, number 45, will actually do some of this because he is threatening to start a new party, the Patriot Party, I think he's calling it. And that would, uh, I, I'm calculating that would take about 45% of the votes away from the Republicans. But be that as it may, we, we have to work on this uh, mindset on two levels. We have to reduce the feeling of separateness that we all feel from one another, separateness from the environment. That's the big underlying infrastructure change that has to happen. And we could also do it in terms of our political system by somehow mitigating the effect of the two-party system. We say that systems that you see in Italy and in France and, and to a lesser extent in India are not two-party, but they, they, um, they're a bit chaotic. So somehow we need to negotiate a middle path there. So I'd like to talk to you briefly now about three organizations that are working in uh, problems of violence that are, are very, very disturbing. The most disturbing, perhaps, is the question 
of human trafficking and the abuse of children and young girls trafficked for sex. Well, there is now a, a group called Operation Underground Railroad. And you can find out about them at ourrescue.org. That's one word, O-U-R-R-E-S-C-U-E dot org. And they're doing a lot to help victims recover and even in some ways to prevent traffic, trafficking. So that's a really welcome development and we should uh, pay attention to it and support it. Related is uh, interesting groups that are now working on domestic violence and two of these organizations, a lot more of them, two of these organizations are offering a series of talks next month in February. And you can look them up by the names of the organization. One of them is called College Brides Walk. And I haven't quite doped out what the relevance is, but that's their name. And the other is called No More Tears. Okay, we're moving on now to some of the other things happening around the country. Uh, there are two protesters from the DAPL protest. There's a Standing Rock protest, and this report is from the Des Moines Register. Their last names are Reznicek and Montoya. They are two women who were with the Des Moines Catholic worker, and they have now pled guilty to multi-million dollar sabotage, for which I imagine the penalty is pretty severe. But the fact is that they have apparently plea bargained so that they're facing only that one charge and dismissing six others. However we feel about that from the point of view of Satyagraha. But it will be interesting to see how this plays out now that the first day of President Biden's holding office First full day, January 21st, where he had a flurry of executive orders, and one of them was canceling that pipeline. So what they did becomes moot, but I'm not sure that that has legal standing, and we may yet see what their witness and what their suffering has accomplished. Now, in a related event, and there are lots of good news happening around ecology, around the world. But popular resistance reports that when Washington State, the Washington Department of Ecology, has rejected the permits, there were several of them, for what would have been a massive methanol refinery in Kalama, Washington. It took uh, more than six years, thousands of written comments and hours of public testimony. Apparently no civil disobedience was tried, or at least has been mentioned. And uh, these comments and testimony were directed to the governor, Governor Inslee, and to this very Department of Ecology, and they came through. They responded beautifully. And Sally Keeley, who is a math professor and a resident of Kalama, says, quote, I'm thrilled they respected our voices. Ecology's decision is cause for celebration for people across the Northwest who value bold leadership to tackle the climate crisis, which of course is now on President Biden's key agenda. So we applaud Governor Inslee and Director Watson's decision to follow the science and the law. We are going to be re- vitalizing a science of nonviolence uh, website very soon because of the the new importance of science now that it has been so politicized but i wanted to make sure we understand the significance of this fracking issue is it can, can pretty much stop fracking in the northwest is that methanol and methane which is a greenhouse gas 24 times more effective than carbon dioxide. It doesn't last as long, but it's drastically effective. And we've all been very much concerned that um, the permafrost, which is softening and melting in the Arctic tundra in Siberia, there are millions and millions of tons of methane trapped 
under that permafrost. And if it gets released into the atmosphere, uh, the effects could be, at the very worst, we hope it won't get this bad. We hope the darn thing is reversed, but those effects could be uh, going over the tipping point. And now, on a happier note, I, I've been talking about the new president and a lot of his innovations. And uh, here's one that almost sounds like the start of a joke about three people going into a bar. You know, a Catholic priest, a, a Buddhist monk, and a rabbit go into a bar, and the rabbit says, I think I'm a typo. That kind of genre. Well, here it is. Cesar Chavez, Rosa Parks, and Dr. King walk into the Oval Office, but it is not a joke. There are sculptures and portraits of these three nonviolence heroes now adorning the walls of President Biden, our new commander chief. We, this is, again, is so important, as, as, as I mentioned in connection with our opening item, we have been calling for and crying for and longing for the mainstreaming of nonviolence. And here you have these three figures in the Oval Office. I mean, it couldn't get more mainstream than that. So the question that we should be asking ourselves is, uh, is this just symbolic? And Pache Bene's, uh, Ken Budigan, whom I mentioned earlier, has written a very thoughtful piece on what the presence of these figures might portend. So I'm not willing to dismiss this as merely symbolic, though I'm famous for being the anti-symbol man in nonviolence because sometimes we take symbolic action for real action and stop at it, and it can be easily dismissed. But no, uh, I think this is a statement of the president's beliefs. These are his role models, or some of them. Uh, and I note with great appreciation that, for example, in the executive orders that he has issued just recently, one of them was to cancel the contracts for private prisons. Private prisons are exactly the wrong solution to mass incar incarceration. Private prisons go back to the 17th century. You can read about how horrendous they were when they are outside the reach of the law, and you have people at your mercy. And there's been some doubt about whether the famous uh, Stanford prison experiment uh, was, was you know, scientifically uh, correct and foolproof, but it does seem to indicate, and there is a factor that we know from other sources, that when people are put into positions of domination, even symbolically, this was an experiment where some graduate students were designated as guards and others designated as prisoners. Uh, sure enough, within a week, the guards became so nasty that the experiment had to be canceled, apparently. So uh, private prisons would be exactly the wrong solution, as I say, to the problem of mass incarceration, which has to start really at the other end of the spectrum before people are propelled into lives of crime. So it will be interesting in this connection to see what the pandemic releases do. You know, it was easy in the past to terrify people into voting for more draconian measures because you had episodes of people being released from prison and then committing crimes. So we now have, I think, thousands of people who had to be released from prison because of the pandemic. And let's just see what that does to the crime rate and how that intersects with some of our nonviolent principles. So moving around a little bit now, I'd start with uh, our northern neighbors. Uh, Canadian activists have recently blocked a shipment of armored vehicles to Saudi Arabia with their bodies. They, they block the transport vehicles. So this definitely was civil disobedience. And one good thing about it is that it was not an isolated event. The, this was one of actually hundreds of actions across the world taking place in protest of the Western-backed war on Yemen, in which Saudi Arabia is uh, the Western proxy 
and it has created what the UN has called one of the most massive humanitarian crises uh, in terms of the uh, starvation that the this attack aerial attack mostly on the Houthi rebels is causing. Obviously, from the nonviolence point of view, we want to set aside the the. <clears throat> the complaints, the issues, whether the law has been broken, and first get in there and feed those people, many of whom are completely outside the conflict to begin with. But even if they were not, they're starving human beings, and that has to be our first priority. So then, now moving further afield, there's a, an event that we've been talking about quite a bit. Uh, it's been going on for three months, a massive public protest in India by farmers. They make up a large fraction of the population of that country. And this was the largest public demonstration march ever, something like 2 million farmers. And they have now successfully, or partly successfully, persuaded the government to suspend the laws that they have been protesting. So they're happy about this court ruling, but they're planning to continue the protests because of two things. The judge formed a committee to address the farmers' grievances, a committee with four, pe four persons on it, and they're unhappy with the makeup of that committee. And because this is only a suspension and not a complete withdrawal of the legislation. Now, this should remind us of the climactic event that happened in South Africa when uh, Gandhi's eight years of Satyagraha struggle against uh, the apartheid regime issued in the appointment of a commission to study the problem in South Africa. And all of Gandhi's friends and supporters, including Gopal Krishna Gokhale, who was his political guru, and the, the British Viceroy of India, who was in, uh, sympathetic until they reached India, they were saying, oh, grab it, grab it, take it. This is what you've worked for. And Gandhi refused. It was an act of incredible, incredible courage, not just against his opponents, but against his supporters saying, no, I know this is the wrong way because this commission has no Indians on it. And I suspect that this is a little bit like what the... Uh, Indian farmers now are protesting about the committee formed by the judge. So he held out and things looked pretty grim for a while, but then the English, uh, or at least uh, English original railroad workers went on strike and Gandhi suspended Satyagraha. And because of that non-embarrassment, uh, General Smuts was moved and they reconstituted the commission uh, with more sympathetic people on it and came to really a successful conclusion. Before getting to our, some of the resources available today, and they are many, just want to mention that in Mongolia, the prime minister has resigned, submitted a letter of resignation after protests in the capital, Ulan Bator, uh, over their COVID-19 policies. And this protest was sparked by a video, which went viral, of the inhumane treatment of a mother and her newborn baby. The mother had COVID. And the prime minister said he should assume the responsibility upon himself and accept the demand of the public, which is an extremely graceful gesture and an appropriate response to the public outcry. And I'm glad it didn't have to get, it didn't have to escalate. But it also brings up the point that uh, this is one of the things about symbolic protests that you never know what picture or what document is going to awaken the conscience of people. And so you just do the right thing. And as always in Satyagraha, according to the Gita's presentation of how human action should be conducted, you do not worry too much about the results. You pay attention to them, but you know if you like using God language, you leave them in the hands of God. You concentrate on the process and on purifying your own approach 
to that process. So now there, there's just so much coming up that uh, we can benefit from. Trainings have just uh, ballooned out. Uh, the not, the uh, network of spiritual progressives organized by our friends at uh, Tikkun, they have a six-week online spiritual activist training that's coming up starting in the middle of February, February 16th. So you can go to tikkun.org to find out about that. Uh, Meta Peace Teams will be putting on uh, a Peace and Popcorn series starting the 30th of this month. This, I guess is tomorrow, if you're listening, on Friday. And it's going to be called In Peace We Trust, and it is online. Indian Country Today is a news, uh, newsletter, online newsletter, that is now reporting that the California Truth Healing Council begins its historic work shortly. This is huge. This is uh, about as big as the reparations uh, effort. The Peace Alliance is has a number of upcoming events, Hope Story Circles, a National Action Call, and the Department of Peace Building Call. And you may remember that that's what originally called the Peace Alliance into existence to have a department level Department of Peace Building in the United States government, which I suppose now looks a little more likely. And by the way, folks, this uh, effort has been on the table for about 200 years. And so we now have the United States Institute of Peace, but it's nowhere near a cabinet level or departmental level uh, institution. So look through those events. This is an event that already passed, so it's not uh, available for us on live, but it may be online. And that was World Localization Day. So this is what Gandhi calls Swadeshi. This is a real triumph of Swadeshi or localism. There were 100 voices from across the world speaking on this if, at this occasion, and they inclu included Russell Brand, Jane Goodall, Vandana Shiva, Noam Chomsky, Joanna Macy, Adebayo, Akumulate, and many others. So if you just put in World Localization Day in YouTube, you should be able to find that. And also, uh, the Abolition of War 101 course will be hosted by World Beyond War, and that begins March 1st. So I just want to mention some meta events. Uh, we have an upcoming screening of our film, The Third Harmony, coming up in an important film festival in Tel Aviv. We will be participating in a course called the Winter Course on Nonviolence that's being put on by Gandhi Research Foundation. And you can find that online. And that starts tomorrow and the following Saturday uh, for my presentations. Anyway, it goes on a little bit further than that. So do look at Meta Center for Nonviolence uh, to follow us for more of these events. And tune in again in a couple of weeks for our next nonviolence report. This has been another episode of Nonviolence Radio. We want to thank Stephen Zunas, Michael Negler, Matt Watrous, Julia White, to all of our listeners, especially to our mother station listeners at KWMR. And to everybody out there, learn about nonviolence, and that's the way to take care of one another. Have a good day.